ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد so continuing then with our studies into al-aqidah al-wasitiyah of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala we arrived at hadith number 15 in the section regarding the sunnah and hadith number 15 here fi ithbati qurbillahi ta'ala in affirmation of the nearness of Allah in affirmation of the nearness of Allah so that is the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qawluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lamma rafa'a sahabatu aswatahum bidhikr أيها الناس اربعوا على أنفسكم فإنكم لا تدعون أصم ولا غائبا إنما تدعون سميعا بصيرا إن الذي تدعونه أقرب إلى أحدكم من عنق راحلته In this hadith then, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the companions raised their voices doing the dhikr of Allah, on one occasion when the companions raised their voices in doing the dhikr of Allah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them, O oh people, Take it easy on yourself, for indeed you are not calling upon the one who cannot hear, nor upon the one who is absent. You are calling upon the one who is the all-hearing and the all-seeing, and indeed the one whom you call upon is closer to one of you, than the neck of his riding animal. As Shaykh al Thaymin rahimahullah ta'ala mentions here, Kana al-Sahaba radiyallahu anhum ma'a al-Nabiy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam idha alaw nashzan kabbaru wa idha nazalu wadiyan sabbahu لأن الإنسان إذا ارتفع قد يتعاظم في نفسه ويرى أنه مرتفع عظيم فناسب أن يقول الله أكبر تذكيرا لنفسه بكبرياء الله عز وجل أما إذا نزل فهذا صفول ونزول فيقول سبحان الله تذكيرا لنفسه بتنزه الله عن السفل فكان الصحابة رضي الله عنهم يرفعون أصواتهم بالذكر جدا فقال النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام أيها الناس اربعوا على أنفسكم يعني هونوا عليها So the companions when they used to be traveling and going to different places on their journeys, on their travels, moving around, if they ever went up a hill, for example, or some elevated place, then upon the elevation, they would do the takbir of Allah. Upon the elevation, they would do the takbir of Allah. And then when they came down into the valley area, then they would do the tasbih, say subhanallah. And Shaykh al says this is very suitable and befitting. 
Because when a person goes up a mountain or a hill or some elevated area and sees himself above the rest of the area, then perhaps some element of feeling big comes into him. When you are on top of the mountain or on top of the hill and you see everything else below you, then perhaps some feeling of bigness and greatness and elevation in of himself occurs to him. And so when that situation arises, in order to negate that feeling from yourself and to remember and to recognize that you have no greatness, even though you are here high above everything now, to recognize you have nothing in reality and you are a small servant of Allah, they would say, Allahu Akbar. They would do the takbir of Allah in recognition of Allah being the greatest, in recognition of Allah being the greatest, to nullify any feeling or to check themselves of any feeling of feeling great or big or elevated in that high place. So they would do that as a reminder for themselves that indeed Allah is the greatest. Allahu Akbar. And when they came down to a lower area, down to the bottom of a valley, then they would do the tasbih of Allah. Because when you are low and you are at the bottom, then that is usually associated with the degrading affairs, the affairs that are not of elevation and highness, being low and at the bottom. So then to remind themselves of the greatness of Allah, they would say, Subhanallah, meaning that Allah is free of any deficiencies, any shortcomings, any types of uh, 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 ayub, that Allah is free of all of that, despite them being down and low and in that position now. And this is similar to what a Shaykh al Thaymeen, rahimahullah ta'ala, mentioned in Sifatul Salah, Sifatul Salat in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he said, when a servant prostrates, when you are in the sujood, we know the hadith mentions, أقرب ما يكون العبد من ربه وهو ساجد The closest a servant is to his Lord is when he is in prostration. As Shaykh al said, when you go into prostration, you are now physically the lowest you can get your body. You are now physically in the lowest position you can get your body down on the ground with your head on the ground, hands, knees, legs all on the ground, you are now in that lowest position of yours. And not only that, but your head, which is the most honorable part of your body, your face and your head, this is the most honorable part of your body, you take that, the most honorable part of your body, and you put it down onto the ground where the people's feet they tread upon. And you have done that for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lowered yourself, placed the most honorable part of your body down into the ground where people's feet tread upon, and then you say, in that position of the prayer, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. That, my Lord, is Al-A'la, the most high, free of any deficiency or shortcoming. He is the most high. And you are saying that as a servant of Allah, when you are the most physically low. And having put your head down into the ground where the people's feet tread upon. So that shows the pinnacle 
of al ubudiyah the highest of your ubudiyah of your worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placing yourself down as a servant of Allah your most honorable part into the dust into the ground and then you say but subhana rabbi al a'la and that's why when you demonstrate that level of ubudiyah even though you are physically the lowest you can get the messenger said you are actually the closest you can get to allah despite physically having taken yourself lower you are now actually closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aqrabu ma yakun al abd min rabbihi wa huwa sajid and so here when they went upon an elevation to remind themselves that they are not big now that they are not upon any greatness now they would remind themselves by saying allahu akbar and when they went down and low to remind themselves of the fact that allah is free of any deficiency any shortcoming they would say subhanallah and the point here is when they would do that particularly when they were going up the elevation it mentions in some narrations they would say allahu akbar and they would say it loud going up that hill or that mountain allahu akbar allahu akbar loud they would be saying it so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he observed this from them he said to them ya ayyuhan nas irba'u ala anfusikum o oh people take it easy on yourselves Take it easy on yourselves. فَإِنَّكُمْ لَا تَدْعُونَ أَصَمَّ وَلَا غَائِبًا For indeed, you are not calling upon the one who is a, a deaf or absent. Rather, you are calling upon سَمِيعًا بَصِيرًا You are calling upon the one who is all hearing and all seeing. يَسْمَعُ ذِكْرَكُمْ وَيَرَى أَفْعَالَكُمْ The one who hears your dhikr and sees your actions. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَدْعُونَ أَقْرَبُ إِلَىٰ أَحَدِكُمْ مِنْ عُنُقِ رَاحِلَةِ The one you are calling upon is closer to you than the neck of your riding animal. Because your riding animal, even when you're sitting on that riding animal, then... The part of the body that is in front of you is the neck of that riding animal. And when you are walking holding the reins of that riding animal, the neck of that animal is next to you. So an example is being given that Allah is closer to you than the neck of your riding animal. عُنُقُ الرَّاحِلَ لِلْرَّاكِبْ قَرِيبٌ جِدًّا فَاللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ أَقْرَبُ مِنْ هَذَا إِلَى الْإِنسَانِ وَمَعَ هَذَا فَهُوَ فَوْقَ سَمَاوَاتِهِ عَلَىٰ عَرْشِ So despite the example being given here, that Allah is closer to you than the neck of your riding animal, despite that, despite Allah being that close to His servant, then at the same time Allah is still above all of his creation above all of the heavens above his throne wala munafat bayn al qurbi wal ulu and there is no contradiction between the nearness of allah and the highness of allah li anna shay qad yakunu ba'idan qariban because sometimes Something can be far yet near. هَذَا بِنِسْبَ لِلْمَخْلُوقِ And that is something which occurs within creation. فَكَيْفَ بِالْخَالِقِ So what therefore of the Creator? فَالرَّبُّ عَزَّ وَجَلْ قَرِيبٌ مَعَ عُلُوِّهِ أَقْرَبُ إِلَىٰ أَحَدِنَا مِنْ عُنُقِ رَاحِلَتِهِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close. Along with His Highness, and He is closer to one of us than the neck of the riding animal. 
هذا الحديث فيه فوائد فيه شيء من الصفات السلبية This hadith has within it some of the negated attributes. From them, it is mentioned when the messenger said, you are not calling upon Asam or Ghaib, the one who does not hear or the one who is absent. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have those attributes, rather Allah has the opposite. He is the all-knowing, the all-hearing, the all-seeing in opposition to the one who is deaf and absent and cannot hear, cannot see. وَفِيهِ أَيْضًا أَنَّهُ يَنْبَغِي لِلْإِنسَانِ أَلَّا يَشُقَّ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ فِي الْعِبَادَةِ Also, we can understand from this that it is appropriate and suitable for a person to not burden himself in worship to not overwhelm oneself in worship لِأَنَّ الْإِنسَانَ إِذَا شَقَّ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ تَعِبَتِ النَّفْسُ وَمَلَّتْ وَرُبَّمَ يَتَأَثَّرُ الْبَدْنِ because if a person overdoes things and overwhelms himself then he may become fatigued and may become in a state where he can no longer continue with that worship. He becomes fatigued and becomes tired and bored and unable to continue with that worship. His body may become affected. And so the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in a hadith, اكفلوا من العمل ما تطيقون فإن الله لا يمل حتى تملوا that Take on board the actions that you are capable of. For indeed Allah does not... uh, uh, Yamal is a bit like bored, but not quite that meaning. But Allah does not become bored as long as you do not become bored. Meaning that Allah does not leave your affair as long as you do not leave that affair of worship. But if you become fatigued and you become tired and you can no longer continue with it and you stop then you have abandoned and stopped that worship. And so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have lost your connection in that worship. And that's why there's other narrations that say that the most beloved of the actions to Allah are the small actions, as long as they are, or the constant actions, even if they are small. That the أَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَدْوَمُهَا وَإِنْ قَلْ أَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَدْوَمُهَا وَإِنْ قَلْ That the most beloved of the actions to Allah are the ones that are constant. You consistently do that act of worship. Even if it is a small amount. And that's why the scholars, they give the example of the night prayer. That a person, if he was to pray Qiyamul Layl, Taraweeh, Tahajjud, whatever you call it, if he was going to pray that maybe 40 minutes a night, half an hour a night, but he does that on a reasonably regular basis, as opposed to MashaAllah, brother, thinking I'm going to implement the way that the messenger used to do it. I'm going to recite the whole of Al-Baqarah and Ali Imran and An-Nisa in one raka'ah. And he does it all one night. And then maybe he manages it the second night. But probably more than that, he's never going to get up again. And he's not going to be able to continue with that. So a person doesn't aim to overwhelm himself with what he cannot do. Rather, even if you make it smaller and less, but you are then able to be consistent upon that, it is better. And that's with all things, even with talabul ilm, with seeking knowledge. If a person was going to 20 lessons a week, and he's not memorizing them or revising them, and he's forgetting them, 
then it's better you go to 10 lessons a week. At least then you learn those properly and memorize them. And in the situation here, two lessons a week, three lessons a week, if a person does them, it is a lot. Two, three, four, five, five lessons a week here in the UK. Alhamdulillah, it's a great amount. But a person focuses on those lessons, revises them, goes over the work, reads the book, listens to the recordings, memorizes the evidences. That is the way it is to be done. And that is better than trying to do many more classes where you're not revising or memorizing or anything from them. Because in the long run, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you will remember the ones that you learnt properly and all of the others will be forgotten. So it is better to learn them properly, even if it's less in number, than try to do many and not learn any of them properly. So with everything, with worship, with talab al-ilm, with all of the affairs, a person balances the affair to what he is capable of. But maybe one more point we should mention with that, that a person balances the affair to what he is capable of. Many people, they go to the extreme on the other end. And they say, I am only capable of one lesson per month. MashaAllah. Only one lesson per, that's my capability. Many people are under-evaluating themselves. And it is not befitting. Certainly a person has more capability than one lesson a month or one lesson two months. Certainly a person can do more. The point is many people, they don't push themselves to the capability they actually do. To the capability they actually do have, they don't push themselves to that level. And so maybe they are capable of two lessons a week, but they just sit and do one only, saying I'm not capable of two, and in reality they probably are. So there's a balance on both sides. You don't go to an extreme trying to do too much, but neither do you under-evaluate the affair and don't do enough when you could do more. So there needs to be a balance that is struck with all the affairs, with talab al-ilm and with your worship. So the night prayer, a person doesn't come along and say, I'm only capable of two raka'at every night. That's it, five minutes. Qul huwa Allahu ahad in each raka'ah. The reality is you're capable of more. There's a balance between where it's really just laziness that you're not doing more compared to where it really is a burden upon you to do more. So a person needs to look at that affair in and of himself to determine what he is capable of. So the Shaykh said, فَلَا يَنْبَغِي لِلْإِنسَانِ أَنْ يَشُقَّ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَلْ يَنْبَغِي أَنْ يَصُوصَ نَفْسَهُ A person shouldn't burden himself, but he needs to balance out his affair and look into what he can do. إِذَا وَجَدَ مِنْهَا نَشَاطًا فِي الْعِبَادَةِ عَمِلَ وَاسْتَغَلَّ النَّشَاطِ This is the other thing. In certain times, you may have more free time, you may have more energy you feel, you may have more iman at times than other times. When those times arise, you have more freedom, you have more energy, then the shaykh says, utilize those times to increase the amount that you're doing. And then there may come other times where other affairs are preoccupying you, there are concerns, there are other things. So then you may go back down to a slightly lower level at those times. But you try to utilize the opportunity as you are able. So also the hadith highlights the key point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close, is near. As it mentions in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي So in this ayah Allah says that if my servants ask you then about me, then tell them I am close, I am near, and I answer the dua of the one who calls upon me. So that is the hadith highlighting to us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close and near
to the servants. Hadith number 16 is the hadith regarding seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we covered this topic in detail in the Quran section, the ayat section. So we said you can summarize the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah regarding seeing Allah into the simple method with three points to it. Seeing Allah, it can either be in this world or the afterlife. So the first group of people, they said, you cannot see Allah in this world and you cannot see Allah in the afterlife. That was one group of them. You cannot see Allah in this world and you cannot see Allah in the afterlife. That was some of them. The second group of them said you can see Allah in the afterlife and you can see Allah in this world too. That's the second group of them. The third said you cannot see Allah in this world, but you can see Allah in the afterlife. And that is Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So one group of deviation on one extreme, another group of deviation on the other extreme, and Ahlul Sunnah as always upon the middle path. So one group of them said you cannot see Allah in this world or the afterlife at all. You can never see Allah. And you remember the kinds of evidences they used. For example, لا تدركه الأبصار وهو يدرك الأبصار That the eyesight cannot encompass Allah, but Allah encompasses them. They said there you go. Allah tells us in the Quran, we did this in the ayat section before, Allah tells us that your eyesight cannot encompass seeing him. And we said regarding this ayah, how do you clarify it? What was the principle of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah? That if the people of innovation use an authentic evidence, to try and prove something unauthentic, some bid'ah, then use the same authentic evidence they've used to refute them. Because they are using an authentic evidence, like an ayah of the Qur'an, to prove a bid'ah. That can only mean one thing then. It can only mean that they are using the ayah incorrectly. So therefore Ibn Taymiyyah says, simply use the ayah Correctly and you refute them. So now they say, لا تدركه الأبصار وهو يدرك الأبصار That your eyesight cannot encompass seeing Allah, but He encompasses, sees you. They say, there you go. Allah tells us our eyesight cannot see Him. But Allah didn't say our eyesight cannot see Him. The ayah says, our eyesight cannot encompass and encompassing something is different to seeing it. In fact, the scholars, they said, it is an evidence just from that angle, before you even get into anything else, that this is a proof you will see Allah. Because encompassing something only occurs after seeing. You remember the examples? If somebody says to you, if I say to you, now describe my phone to me. And I don't even show you which one it is yet. Galaxy, Samsung, whatever they are, iPhone. I haven't even shown you what it is. How are you going to describe it yet? It could be a million different phones. It could be the old Nokia brick from the olden days. It could be anything. How are you going to encompass? How are you going to describe when you cannot even see in the first place? But then if I show you and I say now describe the phone. So now at least you can see it. But still you may not encompass it. 
These, they come in different uh, uh, specifications, different amounts of memory on them, different amounts of how many memory is this one, how much is this, how much is that. All the different details you can't tell by just looking at the physical phone. You see it, but you do not encompass the example the scholars give is of the sun and the moon. You see the moon and the sun, you see it with your own eyes, but you do not encompass the reality of them. You do not encompass the size, what is the diameter, the width, the weight, the mass, all those things. You can't work them out just by seeing it. So you see the item, but you do not encompass it. So when Allah said that our eyesight will not encompass him, absolutely. Meaning we will see him, but from the greatness and majesty of Allah, we will not encompass what we see. And they used other evidences like when Musa alayhi salam asked to see Allah. And Allah said, Lan tarani, you will not see me. Lan harfu nafi, it is for negation. But what was the evidence, uh, or what was the refutation on that? So when you combine that evidence with the rest of the evidences in context, then obviously we know that the Lan Tarani, you will not see me, is only referring to this dunya because of the other evidences that you put it into context with, like the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, Lan Taraw Rabbakum Hatta Tamutu. You will not see your Lord until you die. Meaning then after that, you will see your Lord. But on the point of Lan itself, Lan is a what? Harfu nafi, negation for future tense, but for how much of the future tense? Hmm. So the people of innovation claim it is forever. And nafi al muabbat it is forever, unlimited, that you will never, ever see Allah. But as Ibn Malik mentioned in the Alfiyah, that the learn in the Arabic language does not indicate a nafi that is mu'abbat, a nafi that is limitless, forever. It does not indicate that anybody who says it does, then they have not understood the Arabic language. So straight away we know that Lan Tarani does not mean you will never ever see me. It means you will not see me into the future, but to a limit. And what is the limit? Put it together with the other evidences, and we know it is to the limit of the end of this world. And then in the afterlife, all the evidences indicate you will... So here though, the hadith that is mentioned now, those are all the ayat we covered before. The hadith now, where the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّكُمْ سَتَرَوْنَ رَبَّكُمْ كَمَا تَرَوْنَ الْقَمَرَ لَيْلَةَ الْبَدْرِ لَا تُضَامُّونَ فِي رُؤْيَتِهِ فَإِنْ اسْتَضَعْتُمْ ألا تغلبوا على صلاة قبل طلوع الشمس وصلاة قبل غروبها ففعلوا. So in this narration, then the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, "Indeed, you shall see your Lord just as you see the moon on a full moon night. The Badr is a full moon." On the night of a full moon. Because when it is a night of the full moon, you know, you can see how big it is in the sky. The full moon, visible on a clear night. So the messenger said, you shall see your Lord as you see the moon on a full moon night. لا تضامون في رؤيته That you will not struggle or have to push one another aside that there will not be crowding to be able to see something when you are 
in a large mass of people, maybe you have to push and look around to be able to see. But here it mentions, لا تضامون And in other narrations, تضارون That you will not be crowding or pushing or trying to see. It will be clear the vision and to see Allah. So then it mentions, if you are able, then do not allow uh, yourself to be overwhelmed by the prayer before the sunrise and the one before the sunset. We'll come to that in a moment. So here, إِنَّكُمْ سَتَرَوْنَ رَبَّكُمْ أَسِّينُ لِلتَّحْقِيقِ The scene here is for affirmation, for certainty and actualization of that. That you will certainly see your Lord. And it indicates the future tense. كَمَا تَرَوْنَ الْقَمَرِ Just as you see the moon. Here, what if a person says, now you are making a resemblance between Allah and the moon? That you will see Allah just as you see the moon? You're making a resemblance between Allah and the moon? What do we say? Hmm. So, ah. Mm. So in this example of you will see Allah, uh, your Lord, just as you see the full moon on the night of the full moon, the comparison or the resemblance is not being made by the actual sighted item. It's not about what is actually being seen. The example isn't, the resemblance isn't about what is being seen. The example and the resemblance is the method of seeing, not the actual thing being seen. So it's not about the moon, it could be any example. In some narrations it even says the sun. So it's not about the item that is being seen, it is how you are seeing it. That just as you can see the moon on a full night with ease, then you will see Allah with ease. So the method of seeing and how you see, that's the resemblance, not the actual sight. So this is about the ease of seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it also indicates therefore that it is a real vision. Because you see the moon with a real vision, and so you will see Allah with reality, in reality, with your eyes, you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَتَكُونُ رُؤْيَ بَصَرِيَّةِ It will be a sight of the eyes. Because as we've mentioned as well before, in the last time I think we covered it, when the night of al-Isra wal-Mi'raj occurred, did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam see Allah? هَلْ رَأَى النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ رَبَّهُ لَيْلَةَ الْإِسْرَاءِ وَالْمِعْرَاجِ He? But did he see Allah? So did he see Allah? You don't want to say no, but now you said no. (laughs) But did he see Allah then? No. Ah, you were saying something. So you're saying no as well. (coughs) So what about Ibn Abbas? Mm. So, there's a statement, many of the people of innovation try to use it. Qadi and the likes, they try to use this as an example that the companions differed in Aqeedah. Isn't that something about Aqeedah? Seeing Allah on the night of Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj, is it not Aqeedah? Whether the messenger saw Allah or not, it's Aqeedah. Ibn Abbas said yes. Aisha said anybody who says he did is a liar. So there's a few points there. Firstly, yes, it is an aspect of Aqeedah. However, 
In Aqeedah, you have the core beliefs and aspects of Aqeedah. Then you have the branches, the furu'ah. With this topic, what is the core? Regarding the seeing of Allah, the core of it is the believers and the seeing of Allah on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. That is the core of the Aqeedah. Whenever you come to the topic of seeing Allah, it is about the believers and seeing Allah on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, etc. The issue of the night of Al-Isra' Al-Mi'raj is a subsidiary of this issue. It is a branch from this issue. Did the messenger see Allah that night or not? But that isn't the core. The core is about seeing Allah on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. That is the Aqeedah, the basis. So firstly, even, even if this is upon the assumption or uh, assuming that yes there's a difference of opinion between Ibn Abbas and Aisha even if even if and it's not but even if it was we would say they did not differ upon the core of Aqeedah the usul of Aqeedah this is a, a far'i issue it is a branch it is a uh, subsidiary so you could still not say that the companions differed in Aqeedah even if we say that there's a difference between them and there isn't, because the scholars have explained with different explanations. Some of them have mentioned about the two types of sight. There is the sight of the heart, ru'ya al qalbiya and the other one which is of the eyes, the ru'ya qalbiya that is where it is a comprehension or an understanding or a recognition of something, whereas the sight of the eyes is the clear sight of the eyes. So when Ibn Abbas was affirming that the messenger saw Allah, he was talking about the vision of the heart. And with Aisha radiallahu anha, when she said anybody who says the messenger saw Allah is a liar, meaning anybody who says the messenger saw Allah with his eyes, the sight of the eyes is a liar. So there's no contradiction anyway. And there's other explanations of that too. So here... On this topic then, you will see Allah as you see the moon. The comparison is about the sight and how the vision will be easy. It is not about the actual seen sight. When Nabiyu alayhi salatu wassalam yuqarribu al-ma'ani ahyanan bi dhikri al-amthila al-hissiya al-waqiyya kama na'am. So sometimes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to give them real life examples to make it easy to understand the point. Real life examples to make it easy to understand the point. There are other examples here too. So just as you see the moon on a full night, لا تضامون في رؤيته In another version, لا تضامون In another version, لا تضارون أي لا يلحقكم ضيم والضيم الظل والمعنى لا يحجب لا يحجب بعضكم بعضا عن رؤية. so when it's تضامون without a شدة تضامون not تضامون تضامون without a شدة that is in reference to like if there was a big crowd of people people may cover your line of sight. That there will be no such thing as anybody or any object or any type of other thing covering your line of sight or darkening your line of sight to be able to see. That will not occur. With a shadda la tudamuna bitashdid al meem or with a fathita tadamuna yani la yandam ba'dukum ila ba'd fi ru'yati. And this is now talking about crowding that you will not be squashed up crowded trying to see as you would be if there was a big crowd trying to see something you're not going to be squashed up crowding over each other trying to see that is to tadamuna and as for tadaruna and tadaruna with the shadda and without the shadda يعني لا يلحقكم ضرر that you will not be harmed in any way there will be no harm that occurs to you which would be expected otherwise with a crowd of people trying to see, pushing, shoving. No harm will come to you in any way. And then, فَإِنِ اسْتَضَعَتُمْ أَلَّا 
تغلب على صلاة قبل طلوع الشمس وصلاة قبل غروبها ففعلوا الصلاة قبل طلوع الشمس هي الفجر وقبل غروبها هي العصر So here an emphasis is given upon the prayer before the sunrise فجر and the prayer before the sunset عصر والعصر أفضل من الفجر and it is mentioned that عصر is superior than the fajr لأنها الصلاة الوسطى التي خصها الله بالأمر بالمحافظة عليها بعد التعميم because it is the middle prayer many of the scholars they say the tafsir of الصلاة الوسطى is العصر and therefore upon that tafsir Allah has specifically informed us to safeguard over the Asr prayer uh, and also وَالْفَجَرْ أَفْضَلْ مِنْ العصر مِنْ وَجْهِ from another angle from another angle Al-Fajr is أَفْضَلْ مِنَ العصر مِنْ وَجْهِ from another angle and that is because لِأَنَّهَا الصَّلَاةُ الْمَشْهُودَةِ كما قال تعالى وَقُرْآنَ الْفَجْرِ إِنَّ قُرْآنَ الْفَجْرِ كَانَ مَشْهُودًا that the Fajr prayer is witnessed and some of the narrations mention how the angels they descend and witness وَجَاءَ فِي الْحَدِيثِ الصَّحِيحِ مَنْ صَلَّ الْبَرْدَيْنِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ وَهُمَ الْفَجْرُ الْعَصَرِ in some narrations it mentions the one who prays those two the Fajr and the Asr enters paradise and that is to highlight the importance of those two prayers. Not that somebody who prays them and doesn't pray the others will enter paradise. It is to em- emphasize the importance of that part. It's like when you say, al hajju arafa. The hadith, hajj is arafa. Does that mean if you go and do arafa, nothing else you've done hajj? Of course not. There are other parts you must do and there will be fidya you have to give. There's lots of other things. It's like a dua huwa al-ibadah. Dua, it is the worship. Is that it? Nothing else? Of course, there are many other forms, but this is to highlight the importance of that act of worship. So, what are the attributes that we learn here? Fi hadha al-hadith min sifat Allah, ithbat anna Allah yura, wa qad sabaqa sharhu hadhi sifa. عند ذكر الآيات الدالة عليها We already covered this before about Allah سبحانه وتعالى being seen and there were four ayat that were covered in that section previously ولهذا ذهب بعض العلماء إلى أن من أنكر رؤية الله تعالى فهو كافر مرتد And that's why some scholars they said anybody who rejects seeing Allah He's a disbeliever apostate because he has denied the ayat of the Qur'an. وَسَبَقَ لَنَا أَنَّ أَهْلَ التَّعْطِيلِ يُؤَوِّلُونَ هَذِهِ الْأَحَدِيثِ وَيُفَسِّرُونَ الرُّؤْيَ بِرُؤْيَةِ الْعِلْمِ وَسَبَقَ بُطْلَانُ قَوْلِهِمْ And some of the people of innovation, they said that the vision is only the vision of the heart of knowledge. And that was refuted as well. And then, قوله إلى أمثال هذه الأحاديث and others to the likes of these narrations. يعني انظر إلى أمثال هذه الأحاديث التي يخبر بها النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عن ربه فما كان مثلها ثبوتا ودلالة فحكمه حكمها. So look at the other narrations of this nature. That talk about the attributes of Allah, the authentic narrations, all of them have that same ruling. And then, قوله الفرقة الناجية الفرقة يعني الطائفة الناجية التي نجت من الدنيا من البدع وفي الآخرة من النار. So the saved sect, those who are saved in this world from innovation and in the afterlife from the fire, أهل السنة والجماعة. And uh, the people of Sunnah and Jama'ah يُؤْمِنُونَ بِذَلِكَ كَمَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أَخْبَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ فِي كِتَابِهِ They believe in that just as they believe in what Allah has mentioned in His book. 
And then that mentions at the end, مِنْ غَيْرِ تَحْرِيفٍ وَلَا تَعْطِيلٍ وَمِنْ غَيْرِ تَكْيِيفٍ وَلَا تَمْثِيلٍ That is all done without those four prohibitions. The four prohibitions of tahrif, of distortion, of ta'atil, of rejection, of takyif, of giving description, and tamthil, of making resemblance and comparison. We don't do any of those things when it comes to the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That brings us to the end of that particular section of al wasatiyah The next section we'll begin with after Ramadan now is going to be Makana to Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'a Baina Firaq al Ummah Wat Tisafihim Bil Wasatiyah. The position of Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'a in regards to the deviated groups and how Ahl Sunnah are upon the